everybody. Welcome to Beyond Recovery. I am host Matt Gardner. And today on the show, we have Coach Chase. And Chase is on the show. We're going to be talking a few different things. I'm going to give you a little rundown on what Chase has got going on. And life and fitness coach and his Primal Man Pathway program helps men finally become proud of the man in the mirror, both inside and out. Chase, how are you doing today? doing wonderful brother i love that intro i love the music live with the intro yeah i feel yeah. like i'm listening to it live that's great yeah exactly i like to as we mentioned in the preamble i love i love kind of having a live feel to the show so that's uh yeah that's more exciting to me than than um you know a huge pile of edits afterwards so nothing against uh editing in that sense but but yeah, dude, I'm super happy to have you on the show. Um, we did a little show swap. I was, uh, I was happy to be on your show. And as it was, I'm, uh, I'm coming back on for part two. So we're having this uh, kind of two-week collaboration going on here, which is super rad. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I met you through the Enlifted Coaches community. So, um, you know, it's been a big part of the program that I've been creating. I know it's a, a big part of your story and your program as well. Before we get into that, though, uh, just in the, as far as the theme of the show and, you know, beyond recovery and such, I'm very interested in, I know, a part of your history being in the Navy and just getting into a little bit of, um, you know, this, along with the Navy, there's like some, obviously, I'm sure I'm imagining there's some ego and there's some bravado and such, and there is a, a drinking culture. I got that impression from you anyways, in the Navy. Uh, so let's just start with that. And what was your experience like in the Navy and how did that look as far as with you and your, um, you know, your drinking or any other substances that may have come up as well? I love it. And, um, to lay the background for this one, I was taking swigs of Bacardi out of my parents' cabinet at age 13. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's somewhat a generational thing. I think like my parents stayed up late around a fire pit with the other neighbors until the sun came up, you know, at times like, you know, and they also went to work and handled their shit. And, and it, it all like there, I grew up in a middle-class upper middle-class neighborhood, but they all stayed up late drinking on the weekends. Um, so even before the Navy, cause I went in at the Navy at 21 and 21, almost 22. So senior year of high school, I mean, other substances, I, I, myself and a buddy went through, I'm forgetting now, I think it was a thousand or $2,000 in a month on cocaine. Um, and I, I dropped that cold Turkey. I've always had this, like, I, I most definitely have an addictive personality. I'll roll straight deep into something. And I also acquired the ability to flip the switch back off along the way. If that makes sense. Like yeah. when I'm in it, I'm in it. And I'm like, then eh, I'm good. I'm done. I quit Coke cold Turkey. Um, I smoked cigarettes when I was a kid. Uh, there's one day and I, I stopped smoking them until after I would lift weights when I was like 19. And I just decided to stop and I stopped. Uh, I understand it's not as easy for some people out there. Um, and still when I get going or for a while there, when I got going, I could get going. Even before the Navy and before I was 21, there was a Halloween party that I went to and there was jungle juice there. I drove home from it and woke up in the morning with a nice red stain going down the side of my bed because I threw up in my sleep. There were multiple times when I was 17 or 18 that I had fallen asleep at a party and I had to get rolled over because I was about to throw up in my sleep. Um, you know, and this was like the culture of the, the group I ran with, you know, um, and maybe I went harder than some of them. I don't know. I was too intoxicated to remember. <laughs> and, yeah. You know, when I got, when I turned 21, I was out at the local bars every weekend and every weeknight that there was a special, I was serving tables. So like in the service industry, that is just, that's the life right there. Um, and then I went into the Navy and when I was in, you know, Great Lakes Naval Station is 45 minutes away from my hometown. That's where boot camp is. That's where my school was for my job too. So we would come home on the weekends. Like I said, my parents drink. I, um, they go stints without drinking, you know, after like something will happen in the family or they realize that, uh, so to find that how you will, whether it's heavy drinking or alcoholism, I, there's seems to be a gray area there because they don't 
need it, need it. They'll go a week or two or three. And then next thing you know, it's five, six drinks a night again. Anyway, I digress. Love you, mom and dad. And I would come home on the weekends. We'd party at the pool all day at my parents' house. And then I'd walk to the bar at night and get sloppy and then catch a cab to the 4 a.m. bar and get sloppier. And there were times that, you know, this is before Uber. You know, it's like 2010. So it's before you can get an Uber in the suburbs. And I would walk home from the 4 a.m. bar if there weren't cabs out front. And that was like a 40-minute walk, just stumbling home. So that's the front side of the Navy. I got to San Diego the first night I was there. I got absolutely housed. Um, and I fell in with a group of guys that, cool guys, and we were going out every weekend. There was a bar we went to on Wednesday that had uh, 250 U call it's for college night for SDSU. So I'd go up to the bar. I'd get a shot of Rumpelman's and a Long Island iced tea. And that went on up until my first deployment. First deployment, we lived on the ship in Bahrain. I didn't have standard naval deployments. We didn't sail. We flew over to Bahrain, manned up a, a ship, and came back home. So because I lived on the ship in Bahrain, I didn't bother going out. Um, I was like, well, I, why do I want to come back and stumble down this steep staircase into birthing? So that was six plus seven months of uh, sobriety there. And I got back, I was like, ooh, I feel good. And I actually started shifting what I would do on the weekends. I, I, there were Fridays that I didn't go out because I wanted to wake up and work out and sit by the pool. Now, the thing is, when I would go out, I'd go to one of those bars that had 250U collets or $2 shots of Fireball. And next thing you know, I am in a relationship with... Uh, um. Uh, a woman that was eight shades of crazy and uh, danced half nude for a living. And mm -hmm. like, yep. yeah, like you're picking and, your words there. Like it, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, waking up late for work because we drank a couple of like a few four locos the night before and I'm still at her house and I'm even further from base and the ship and flying through traffic in my Camaro. And it was after that, that I started to really call it. That being said, you know, I'll go home on leave and I would still go ham. Cause like, that was what my buddies were doing. I remember waking up next to my bed one time when I was home on leave naked. I'm like, why am I nude next, next to my bed? I look over and my boxers are soaked in urine. Mm. Like, huh? That's not normal. Uh, that's, that's not right. Uh, and that happened a couple of times while I was in the military. Uh, mainly when I would be home on leave and I was just letting loose, you know, after a deployment of not drinking. And then when I was about to get out and I, we went out for my last night uh, in Bahrain and my second and third deployment, we got flats. So I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll go out every once in a blue moon. Um, my second deployment, Wow. I forgot about this one. Backtrack. Mm. Second deployment. Mm. I woke up in the morning and there was vomit all over the floor of my bedroom, uh, between mine and my roommate's bed. Cause I came home housed and just, yes. just yeah. ralphed and ralphed and ralphed and then passed out. Right. Um, third, I, I ended up, I think I ended up living on the ship for a couple of weeks cause of that one. Um, after that, my third deployment, that last night out before I went home and got out of the Navy, I was drinking bullfrogs, which is like this Middle Eastern Long Island iced tea mm. uh, made with an energy drink that's illegal in the States. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. So it's got like all the booze of a Long Island and then some, and then it's made with this energy drink that's illegal in the States. So I was, had a few of those. I had some shots of absinthe. I'm sure I had a few beers and I woke up in the morning. And I'm in the recliner in our flat. I didn't even get to my bed. Just walked in in the recliner. I'm like, huh. And I look over to my left and there's this like lime green crust run, running down the side of the recliner. 
you know, it was about the color of a bullfrog. Bullfrog, yeah, I was going to suggest, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, my my flatmate had already, and this was this was the Navy, right? To get back to the drinking culture thing, yeah. like, yeah, we mopped up your puke, let you sleep. I was like, well, thank you, and that's one thing about the. I guess that came full circle because one of the things that cemented or very early on my decision to get out of the Navy was my first deployment. I was, uh, I was standing watch and one of the more senior enlisted middle enlisted guys, much more senior than myself came back from being out in town. He was drunk. He had to be helped down to his rack and there was puke in the duty van. Guess who got to go clean that puke up? Mm, yeah. Well, I have an idea. Yeah. Fireman yeah. Tolleson. So <laughs> I guess that getting my puke cleaned up came full circle. So yeah. all that to be said, when I got out of the Navy, there was some heavy, there was one or two instances of like heavy drinking. And as I opened my gym, um, that started taking more of my time. I started realizing how drinking was affecting me, uh, started put, cutting back immensely. Uh, I only puked. The last time I puked was 2016. And that was because it was, we're partying for 4th of July and there was caribou Lou, which I used to be able to drink a lot more of than I'm able to now. Uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah. Yeah. And it's been a gradual process to the point now where like I had a glass of scotch with dinner the other night. Well, Japanese whiskey, but it tastes like scotch because Japanese whiskey is more akin to scotch. And, uh, like I enjoyed it. And at the same time, I'm like, I didn't really need that. Mm. You know, like I, I'm like, yeah. mm, it's nice. Oh, look, it's a twenty-four dollar glass of whiskey, but it sure. wasn't that good. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, yeah. No, interesting stuff. I want to, I want to circle back to a few different topics that came up that uh, I want to unpack a little bit more. When you were saying that flipping the switch, that's so interesting because I know there's going to be folks that are listening to this that are just like, man, I, myself included, I really yeah. wish I could do that. What does that look like? What does that feel like? Was that just a matter of, of, yeah, like what is the process for you when you flip a switch? Is it a mindset thing and you just, you're able to just, just like that, you drop it, you don't think about it anymore? Like just, yeah, if you can explain or elaborate on the flipping of the switch there. So part of it is I've been in tune with how things make me feel since I was like a teenager, like mm. how they affect my body. Um, uh, and like when it came to doing Coke, like I didn't like the way I felt like mm. the, yeah. the next day, the day, even the day of like, while I'm in the middle of it, I'm like, why am I doing this? And when I can align it with like, I don't like this. When I quit smoking cigarettes, I was like, why am I doing this? I don't really enjoy this buzz, you know? So, and then when it comes to alcohol, like I got to the point where uh, I remember at my parents' housewarming party and they had Caprahanas, which are these like uh, Brazilian margaritas. They have a certain kind of rum in them, I think. Um, so it's not, mar it tastes like a margarita, but it's got like this Brazilian rum. Um, and I remember throwing darts at my parents' housewarming party in 2014. And I'm like, oh, I can't throw darts anymore. I mean, at this point I was, I could throw darts. <laughs> and uh, one, that was one of the first times I'm like, why, um, uh, why, why the impaired motor control, why the, uh, impaired emotional intelligence, the ability to have a good conversation. And when I started really wrapping my mind around that. I'm like, what is this doing for me? Mm. Uh, yeah. and nothing. And then for, you know, especially as I got into my late twenties and closing in on 30 and now I'm 34, like if I drink, like the next 72 hours are diminished. I mean, energy mental acuity, mental acuity, emotional intelligence. So yes, I can like go, okay, I'm done with it. And thank you for asking for the elaboration. Cause it's often, a, a buildup of why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? And that switch is often stuck for a little bit. And then it's just like, whack, right? No, I'm not. Cause for me, it's, I know that one or two drinks starts to dry me out. Yeah. So like, yeah. you know, that one I had with dinner the other night, I'm like, eh, I ordered it because my buddy I was out with ordered an old fashioned, you know? And it's like, well, I guess I'm going to order a drink. <laughs> and like, I didn't need to. So yeah, that's, 
that's the switch. And for me, it's uh, often like all or nothing. And yeah, you know, I've, I've started to realize for some context around like being in tune in uh, Aruba in 2019, 2020, 2019. Um, we were out to dinner just off the resort family vacation. And we we're having some really nice seafood dinner. I'd ordered a, a red wine to go with my salmon and I think it was a Pinot. And I got like half the glass done. And I looked at my wife. I was like, Hey baby, you want this? Like I'm, this is drying me out. I can feel it. And my brother looks at me, rest in peace. And he looks at me, he goes, you're the most self-aware individual that I know. <laughs> so uh, yeah. yeah, long, long winded answer. And no, no, that's great. The other thing I, I guess that, the next question that comes up from that. So you explain it as, as far as like being in tune with your body and such. My next question would be, you never felt the need to use alcohol or substance to get yourself to a place that you imagined that you needed to be. What I mean is like, it didn't enhance your personality. And like, cause oftentimes, you know, I, and I'll speak from my own experience. I was using for, to get myself out of my shell. We talked about it on your show, right? As a, being a shy kid, I used it as a, what I perceived as something that was helping me come out of my mm -hmm. shell. I, of course, then we, you know, acknowledge that, of course, that's, it's doing quite the opposite, but it, initially it feels like that. So you never, you know, I'm curious, so, did you ever feel like that was happening oh, for you with yeah, the cocaine that, or drinking? Um, drinking. I mean, Coke, I'm sure. Yeah. I was a dick though. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, drinking. Yeah. I mean, 21 and younger, Dude, how old was I when I threw that New Year's party in the basement when my parents had a party going on upstairs? And I ended up upstairs in the middle of all their friends because there wasn't a sink in my basement. Puking, actually, there was. There was a slop sink, but I forgot about it. Puking in the kitchen sink. Oh, yes. Uh, and I was like 15. Oh, okay. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and as far as coming out of my shell, like, yeah, cannabis took, took the lead on through like the high school years in like 18, 19, 20, 21, it was, uh, back in that booze more so. And, uh, I mean, dude, alcohol was my identity. I had a Facebook picture that was me drinking straight out of a pitcher of beer at the bar, like <laughs> tipping it up while it was almost empty, you know, like yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would go to the bar and I would order liquid cocaines for fun. Jaeger, Rumpelman's and Goldschlager in the same shot glass. Whew. And I would, I would down multiple of those a night. Like I was the guy who could do that. And then I'd still drive home because I was a f idiot, mm. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, you know? So, I mean, it, it was my identity for a bit there. I was out at bars being the tough guy. I never actually got in a fight, but I had enough for reputation in town that that barely ever needed to happen. Um, I, I, yeah, I, and the amount of parties that I'll be at, like there was one where I drank like a whole fifth of Jack and then drove home from a party one time. Mm. Um, cause somebody said they could drink whiskey with me. <laughs> yeah. I <I'll> bet. <laughs> but, right. Okay. Um, so there definitely yeah. was, okay. No, no thanks yeah. for painting that picture. So there definitely yep. was, that was a big part of your, you know, the late teenage years, early twenties chase mm -hmm. then. Correct. So when was the shift for you that you would prioritize your own, health over what you perceived was this identity because that i think that's a, a big hang up for a lot of people is like you know this fear of letting go of what they've identified themselves with regardless of what it's doing to their health right so for you is this a change of priorities or how would you how would you explain that i had two warring identities in my head the the fitness guy and the the partier the guy that would go out and get sloppy drunk and make out with girls at bars right um and the fitness guy started to win gotcha. uh, essentially. Okay. And yeah, you know, and, and part of the reason that I can speak on, this is the first time getting to articulate this. So thank you. Uh, thank you. part of the reason get it, that I have the ground to stand on when I speak on the gym is not therapy. It's not, you can, it can still be a, like, there are a lot of people treating the gym the way an alcoholic treats a bottle of tequila, right? Because I would go to the base gym as soon as it opened. I would, I would do a workout. I would swim laps. I'd sit by the pool for a bit. If this was like a Saturday, you know, and I was actually off work on the weekend for once, cause I worked in the engine rooms and that was a rare thing. Um, I would, I would work out. I would sit by the pool. I'd swim some laps. I'd sit by the pool some more. I'd go for a run. 
And then I'd go back in and I'd lift some more weights before they shut down. So I was like, well, I'm not drinking. So I'm going to, I'm going to do some fitness. Right. You know, and, and yeah. I, I saw it when I ran my gym and I'm sure a lot of people listening, or maybe you've even seen it where people come out of alcoholism or another addiction and they go, Oh, what am I going to fill this with now? Yeah. I mean, hundred percent, hundred percent. That that was mine. So I, I started for me, fitness was, was always on the periphery. It was one of these things that I would, I, Oh, I might. The, the I need to, you know, the kind of things we talking and lifted, like I, I need to get this done or like I, I should be doing this at some point. Right. And so that was my, as soon as I, I quit drinking, I replaced that energy of always hiding and getting over on people and such immediately shifted that into working out. So, and you know, and that, you know, I, yeah, long-term you still have to do the work as to why I was drinking in the first place. But I mean, the, uh, the fact that I was, I was getting, uh, more physically fit and feeling much better about myself in a much more natural way was a great thing short term. So I want to make that it's, it's worth mentioning. I've, I've said this on an episode yeah. before, but let's ca- cover it again. Anyways, I want to get your take on it. You know, by no means. And like you said, the gym is therapy line. By no means do you want to get to the stage where you're just replacing one addiction for the next without actually dealing with why you had the addiction in the first place. However, having said that, uh, you know, doing this with your arm, drinking versus like you know going to the yeah. gym such a difference right so that was yeah I'm, i relate to what i am for sure i am all for it being a step uh, a rung in the ladder exactly yeah. all for that i watched a handful of individuals come through my gym and that we had one in particular and he never addressed the reasons mm. that he had a problem with alcohol and he had a problem with alcohol he still mm. does he still gets on my instagram and tries to troll and leave nasty comments sometimes under a new account and then a new account here, a new account here after I block them. Um, and we gave this guy a lot of chances and he would come in and he'd go hard on workouts and get so revved up when he hit new big weights. And then one little thing would happen in his life. We don't see him for a couple of weeks. Right. He comes back and he looks like crap. Um, and then he comes back, you know, and he, he started getting out of line at, uh, community events. And Mm. there was a wedding that a lot of gym people were invited to, and he slapped one of the coaches, uh, butts and I didn't slap a coach, but slapped her butt and she's married. Um, you know, that wouldn't be right with a single woman as is. And he walks up, I was standing next to her talking and he walks up and slaps both of our butts. Like, it's just no big deal. And then that blew up. So it is, it's, uh, it can be a step and make sure it's a step, not a, a resting place or a, something that, you know, that look inside can be scary. And I get it. Like I, I still have things that come up like that. I'm like, Oh no, I'm a coach. I got this. I can work through it. My wife's like, Hey, maybe you should get out your damn journal and write that down. Yeah. <laughs> like, right. Yeah. Right. No, this is a, this is a great, great natural, you know, segue into, you know, looking inside. So I know a big part of your journey, you, you owned a gym for, I want to say in around eight years mm-hmm. and you know, you were that guy, you mentioned you were the guy that's 24 you know, seven, that you're the fitness guy, right? That's your new identity. Somewhere along the line, you, uh, you picked up this, uh, this whole, um, you know, the story work, the language the importance of words. And then you were able to take a step back from your own, this and create this, forge this new identity that. I imagine feels much more complete, right? And you are dealing with some of these things that you've been avoiding pushing down that like so many of us do, right? So what can you explain and just describe as far as um, how big of a game changer it was to get into like the Enlifted community, you know, and that's where you and I met. Uh, and what, what, uh, what you know, changes have made, uh, been made to you as far as, uh, you know, auditing your own language and, and you know, and the, the whole story work process. Yeah. Great question. I had an idea around mindset starting in 2018 ish. I think I really started diving in. Uh, if I'm looking at my Facebook memories, like 2018, I'm like, Oh wow, you were posting some good stuff. Uh, I think it was 2016, 2017. One of my members actually said 2017, one of my members like you should write a blog because some of your social media posts are so I had this idea, right? It was just this thing. I'm like, Hey guys, do these things. Like, this is how you do it. Just like, be happy. Just make the choice. Um, cause I, I have in the past in my life been able to implement things and integrate them into my own life without really looking at how I did it. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm like, Hey, just do what I did. I don't know what I did, but it works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Take it from yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. So, you know, we had Mark England on the, my gym's podcast in 2020. And this was when, before he was, before and lifted was the thing that he and Kimberly now were talking about as go out and be guests on podcasts. And he's just talking about the words and not just, he was talking about the words and we get down. I'm like, Hey, what's this in lifted thing that you're associated with? He's like, Oh, about that. Uh, you and I should hop on a call. Mm. So half an hour after the podcast, Mark and I are on a one-on-one call and yeah. I hopped in with group nine, uh, after their kickoff call, actually, after like the introduction call, I got thrown right into it, jumped no right in. Yeah. yeah it's it right. so cool. That is, um, signed up for level two at my level one graduation and signed up for level three, like on the first level two call. I was like, I'm going all the way in. Yeah. And I had been introduced to core language upgrade vocabulary in January, 2017. I listened to that barbell shrugged episode that Mark talks about when it released. Mm, uh, wow. My wife, Sarah didn't want to watch core language upgrade. Cause Mark had beady little eyes in it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh shit! Yep. That yep. Is- uh, I've told a- Adam Chin lost it when I told him that. Oh man! <laughs> so, uh, and she opened up to it eventually. This was still back in the day, like we were uh, engaged. We had just moved in together. She was still adjusting to me, coaching her at the gym, like so taking something that I'm like, "Hey, I heard this on a podcast. I really want to do it." Yeah. And me still not knowing how to ease people into things. So I, I get it that she found a reason to yeah. be resistant. Totally. And like I had implemented core language upgrade with the coaches at the gym. I knew some of the importance of words. And when I got into the lifted, it's like, oh, this is how we can use it. Mm-hmm. This is how we can integrate it. And this is how we can quite literally have like the samurai take out the light, how we can quite literally have the samurai sort of personal development. I don't know if Mark still uses that one on the sales calls. He used it on me though. (laughs) And uh, it's so accurate. Yeah. Um, And it actually, that was the beginning of the end for the brick and mortar gym for me, because I was building an online program as I was going through and lifted. And I was like, I want to include and lift it in my online program. It's going to be a thing. Like if we're affecting change and pe- the guys online are so receptive to it because you're not negation knowledge, able to stand over them and okay, wait now do this with your, okay. Now take a breath here. Now brace here. Now squeeze your feet into the ground. Now, you know, rotate your ankles this way. It's you're not movement coach. And when you're with them for an hour, you're talking, you're so those online check-ins went from, okay, well, what are you doing? Okay. Well, you're doing this. Well, let's do this To, What are you doing? Okay. Uh, write that down. How's it feel to write that? How's it feel to read it? What's that feel like? Okay. This is why you're doing that. That thing from 12 years old that came up, um, or when you got hit by a T-ball when you were eight years old and now we're going to clear it. And then their habits shifted, but people in the brick and mortar were so resistant to it because they want to come in and break a sweat and leave. Sure. You know, yeah. So we, we implemented affirmations during the group class. We, we did some language workshops that were, had some attendance and some, eh. um, you know, the, the people that were into it, were into it in the brick and mortar and most people want the other stuff. So now I have more freedom of time and I'm able to truly implement the language. It's the first module in the identity piece of my program is the language second one's breath third one's gratitude you know so it's just yeah yeah uh and and it all it it layers and i've said before like especially you know fitness whatever you're doing a lot of people try and start with habits Mm -hmm. by trying to start with habits you're trying to build the ground floor without building a foundation yeah and the foundation is the stories upon which you build it yeah yeah, and then it's obviously anybody that's listening to. Uh, first off, I want to give a shout out to the podcast that you're a co-host of as well. So, Get In Lifted podcast. Everybody should do themselves a favor, check it out. 
And if you want to like, you know, it's, we could go into, you know, we could help do another two or three shows on Enlifted, but it's just a suggestion to be, I believe the first 12 or 13 episodes are on like the Enlifted basics or, you know, the greatest hits, if you will. Right. And it's uh, these kind of these bite-sized uh, episodes of like the main concepts of the Enlifted coaching technique. And it's, it's just amazing. I, lo- I love the, uh, the podcast, not blowing smoke because you're on the show. Like I, it's one of my weekly listens. So really appreciate it. you. Yeah. Thanks, dude. I appreciate you guys. So definitely worth checking out and uh, just uh you know I, is there anything else that you can uh sum it up to anybody that just has n- obviously has an inkling or an idea of what you're talking about with lifted but for your person say for example your personal experience like how was your first story work process how was that to draw some of this stuff out of you and how did that personally shift what's a personal experience with the inlifted style that you can uh you can we can kind of put a bow on this section before we move on hmm totally put so, on yeah no it's it's interesting because some of my deeper shifts were i, I was unaware of the personal development that i was getting into within lifted mm. um and even so like working a couple of stories my billy story was around how i didn't get a contract as a navy seal uh, because of a rule change that you know and i paid out of pocket for lasik and they changed the rules five days before i went to contract in and it was around, um, well, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. That's all like, why even try. And when I went through level two, that story the I, I managed to clear so much stuck in level one mm. that that story became one of my wins from level two, wow. because I went from somebody that could barely run to running two miles in 13 minutes with a pack on swimming thousands of meters and keeping the same pace running home. Yeah. So yeah. that's, that's the perspective shift. One I like to highlight and I've used it on a a few conversations is my sister, Uh, because after her first 90 minute session, this was when you could still get coaching from Mark England, if you knew the right people to ask. And uh, after her first 90 minute call with him, she went in and talked with her nutrition coach at the gym. And I got a text from that coach after my sister left after 90 minutes of uh, her coaching with Mark. And then, and that coach, goes, your sister's a completely different person. Wow. And she had been in and out of therapy for the last decade prior to that. So wow. yeah. that's, I've seen the Enlifted Method called ther- therapy on steroids, more effective than 20 years of therapy. Like it works and people are resistant to how well it works until they get into it. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. No, no, it's it, awesome. Awesome accounts on both, both accounts for me personally. Absolutely. I've been through therapy for, for 10 years and Mark's analogy to me is so resonates is like therapy is like letting off some steam and the lifted like story work style is like going for the flame, like turning the flame off. So the steam yes. doesn't build up anymore. Right. Dude, you know? dude, I I've made posts like that. <laughs> right. Why, right. why are you constantly, if you're constantly having to let off the steam, yeah. let's check why that's happening. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So for sure, for sure. Hopefully that intrigues enough people to, uh, you know, take out the, hopefully that'll intrigue enough people to check out the podcast and, and, uh, you know, further check out what we're talking about here, but, uh, let's get into your program, man. I know that's uh, it's been big, uh, you know, the primal man pathway you're, uh, in your rookie year, as far as like you certainly have the experience behind, to back you, but as far as this program being out there and in the wild, so to speak, mm-hmm. you know, very exciting. And I, I was saying, you know, before we got started here, uh, just everybody follow, I'll obviously have your, your uh, social medias in the show notes. So everybody give Chase a follow because he gives excellent information. Um, it's just, it's, it's very worthwhile. I love the way that you post. I love your branding and everything you've done. I'm super proud of you. So tell us about Primal Man Pathway. And I know uh, at time of recording here, you're looking at uh, like getting, uh, it's a, correct me if I'm wrong, your second group together, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I, what I do almost two years, 18 months of, uh, between a year and a half and two years of guys one-on-one online. And mm-hmm. that was essentially was like a whole bunch of market research, right? They, they got, you know, six or seven one-on-one calls as opposed to the three that guys in primal man pathway get, because guess what? We have a online program that has, uh, 12 weeks of workouts. You can do my workouts. It's not required. If you have a workout program you like, cool. Um, But 12 weeks of dumbbell only workouts that are effective. Uh, Six lessons on intake, how to eat and fuel yourself. 
six lessons on identity. So that's the, the language, the breath, the gratitude, the journaling, celebrating wins and taking action. And then six lessons on rhythm, sleep, blue light, uh, meditation, daily play, uh, schedule blocking or intuitive scheduling, stuff like that. Cool. Uh, so that what I've done is now guys get to save time. I get to serve more guys because instead of half of our one-on-one calls being the same lifestyle pieces that 98% of my guys were getting, yeah. now you have a, a anywhere from a seven to a 12 minute video to watch and specific integration pieces. I don't like the word homework, um, but specific mm-hmm. integration pieces to do between modules. And you, and, and guess what? You can't get all the modules at once. It's stripped out every two weeks. So those ah. of you that think you're just going to fire hose it. Nope. <laughs> nope. You watch a module. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no week, weekly group calls and, uh, yeah, weekly group calls and everybody gets three to four one-on-one calls with me. People that hop in early, get it, get the program cheaper and get extra one-on-one calls. Cause I, uh, I want to get them coached up before we get rolling. So that's rad. And when is the, uh, the, like there's a wait list or there's a date basically where's when is the upcoming deadline if any some somebody out there's listening is interested in this yeah so i don't know when this will go out the wait list opens up next a week from when we're recording on july 18th okay and then the cohort launches august 1st so the last day to sign up will be like 48 hours prior to that because Okay. Once, you know, I, I want to make sure I have everybody in, have it squared away, putting people in, in the 11th hour is cumbersome. Sure. Absolutely. No, that's great. And we'll make sure that we get this episode out uh, well in advance just to, to, to you know, I get the help you get the word out, man. And that's, it's great. I love what you're doing. And, you know, it's, it, it's just to circle back to one of the topics that we talked about and, you know, a couple of things actually that come to mind. First one being is like, you don't, you do don't want to negation acknowledged. You don't want to replace one addiction with the next. So you have also uh, incorporated, it's like a, a full, like the body, mind, spirit, right? You got meditation, you have integration techniques, you have, you know, things that are uh, going to help align you mentally and getting your schedule together and you have the workouts. So it isn't just like, a, like you say, get your sweat on. It's the full, full meal deal. And, you know, it's so important, man, just the health and fitness industry has come such a long way in the last, like, even five years, but specifically 10 years. Like, even 10 years ago, I was getting made fun of for even thinking about going to yoga. Right now, it's, like, such a common thing. Even meditation, it was so, like, uh, you know, Middle Eastern. Right. It's not, it wasn't, you know, it's it kind of trickled over here. And now it's just such a regular thing, which is so awesome. What is your take on that? Like, you've been around health and wellness industry, around and in this has been your life for 10 plus years at this point. What can you say about like the changes and shifts that have occurred in, in the time that you've been uh, involved? Great question. So I got my first personal training certification in, and I always goof the timeline on this. It was sometime between uh, late 2007, early 2009. And um, um, yeah, so, and I got the certification. I did not get a job with it, I ended up uh, attempting some more school before, you know, going and talking with the military. Uh, that being said, when I went and applied, it was like, answer these anatomy questions. Mm. And okay, you know this stuff? Okay, yeah, you, you can get a job. They actually tried hiring me. And I was like, ooh, yeah. And I'm sure there's still some spots out there like that. Sure. That being said, I opened my gym in 2014 and I mean, everything, you know, CrossFit was so big in the early teens, right? In the yeah. mid teens. Yeah. So it was CrossFit, CrossFit, go hard, go hard, go hard. And it, it started to shift. I think I rode the, I, I imagine I rode the wave of the shift. You know, 2018, I went through a program, OPEX CCP, and they do individualized fitness. And that was where, you know, in their assessment module, they're like, uh, everybody has their own lens and you got to meet them where they're at. And that was like in my rookie coach moment, I'm like, Oh, okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Like, that's really cool. Um, and then when did I start meditating? I think I've been, I think I was playing around with meditation a little bit before that. Uh, my wife went to a gong bath in early 2016 after her mom passed. And then I started trying, I started picking up meditating like with the calm app and stuff like that. And she and I would use calm like for a few years there. 
Uh, and it, it's such an interesting shift because you see people now that five, six years ago were probably, you know, gym bros or meatheads or whatever. And they're like talking about spiritual awakening and mm. dealing with your, your shadow. And I think the shadow sometimes gets over romanticized. That's a whole nother conversation. Um, like, yeah, deal with your demons. And if you're constantly looking for it, like you're going to find it. Yeah. Know? Yeah. hundred um, percent. Um, and people are talking about this stuff now and it's really cool because that is fitness. You know, we, we, uh, we had Julie Fouché, uh, a CrossFit legend on the getting lifted podcast and she's a doctor. She's a functional med doctor. Wow. And she was talking about, it. she's you know, in the relation to stories, she's like, our stories can dictate our health. She's like, and, and she's, she sees a future where the health coach is the trainer and the trainer is the health coach, mm. you know, where it's all intertwined because everything is one and mindfulness and meditation and getting back in touch with ourselves is I'm so excited to see what the next five years brings. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for sharing that story about the, what's her name? Julie. Julie Fouché. Fouché, okay. That's so cool because like, have you heard of Dr. Kim DeRamo? No, that's a new name. So yeah, I'll check her out for sure. She's amazing. Same thing, like had a long history of being a doctor and is very much turned into like just energetic and like, you know, meditation and, and things of that nature. And it's like s stepped away from, um, you know, the medical field and gone more into like a spiritual route, but has that, you know, the medical chops. So that isn't just like, oh, this is hippy dippy. She's like, actually, I can explain this like in a scientific way to you. So it's really interesting. It kind of gives, it gave me a lot of uh, like permission, right? Because I've always felt like there's a, to back it off from always, I, I've often felt that there's been this, uh, you know, like, ah, it's kind of hippie ish. And like, there's a, as a result, I've had this little inner critic that's been a little bit skeptical about some of these things that I, believe in right so where you have something like that it's like permission uh from external source but nonetheless uh you know to be able to okay no there is something to this because she can explain it and she's done like you know been a doctor for like 10 15 years so I should check her out for sure she's super interesting i will uh you talk about that that inner critic you know i worked with uh, an intuitive mentor for 14 weeks mm. and doing readings on people on the phone and, and doing energy healing stuff and like i I had a past, like, okay, this is a fun tangent. I, yeah. The reason I met her is because I asked one of my clients who's a witch um, for a reference for somebody who could do a good past live session. Wicked. I love this. Yeah. yeah. And she, the first life that she um, brought up, I'm looking up my whiteboard because I have all my notes on here still from like months ago. And she goes, okay, we're ancient and you're in a toga and you're famous and you're a philosopher. Like, like either like Plato and Socrates level philosopher Whoa. and a lot of wisdom and trust. And I see a serpent of wisdom and there were statues of you and you studied and channeled wisdom. You lived the life of a scholar and you were famous. Um, but yeah, okay. This is all I'm, I'm tracking. Cause I took notes in different colors for the yeah. different lives. <laughs> Yeah. But she, I, yeah. I was all about the truth, written word, more interested in information. My words enlightened the mind. My words were engraved somewhere. Um, even as a small child, I was intuitive and smoked, spoke the truth. My education was early. And then she goes, I don't usually hear names, but I'm hearing platonic. Like you might have been Plato. And I was like, and like my logical mind tries to destroy this. Right. But a, sure. a few lives later, and there were a couple, like I was, uh, a woman singing classical Chinese with a stringed instrument, beautiful voice. But like, I was confined to a palace to do that. I was a woman that died giving childbirth. I was a spoiled Dutch kid who came over here on his dad's ship to the new world with slaves, but then grew a bigger heart. And naturally it was like, like it was the times you had slaves, but I, I like cared for them, you know? Mm. Um, and then she gets to one where she's like, Oh, this is beautiful. You're at a monastery. You spend all day chanting and meditating. And she's like, this is like a monastery that's never been before and never will be again. And it was only for the chosen. And she hadn't said monk yet. And I was like, am I a monk? Right. So and she's like, yeah, you're like one of the monks, like levitating and astral projecting for people. And, 
And my logical mind as I'm retelling this tries to destroy it, right? Yes. When she's recalling it, I cried spontaneously twice. Hmm. It was like remembering something I didn't know I missed. Yeah, yeah. I got you. So then I was... I got back in touch with her. I was like, Hey, if my soul's done that, uh, I'd imagine we can find something in there. Why don't, can, can we, I see you do one-on-one work. Can we do that? Yeah. Um, so yeah. Uh, and, and people that I worked on, like I would still try and discredit it. Right. Yeah. But, uh, she'd be like, what's something that, uh, lights this person up or a food they're excited about. I'm like, uh, ice cream, chocolate, rainbow sprinkles. And she didn't tell me beforehand, but we were talking about her son. We were channeling her son's soul. And she's like, that's what he gets every time we go out to eat. Wow. Um, there were people I did energy work on, like shifted stuff for them that would get in touch with her like two days later saying they were still feeling the remnants of it. Wow. So you get this. It, it's so like the, the, the programming and what we learn coming up disconnects us from all of that. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure there is some, there's some of that out there that like, yeah, our logical mind can actually find holes in. And, and there's other that like, there's something else there. Yeah, absolutely. No, thanks for sharing that. That's that's tremendous. When you're, when you're talking about, especially when you're talking about like the importance of words and all that, I wonder how much of, you know, what could be in a past life that when you rediscover it in your current life and that's why it resonates with you so much is because it has been, you know, it's like it's it's almost been willed to come your way in this current manifestation of, of you. Like, do you believe in, in, in that? So I mean- parallels or, or comparisons right to your current current yeah i'm I'm, I'm a bit philosophical like hey guys go check out the mystical giants album on spotify yeah um <laughs> i i have like i had singing bowls behind me before i ever knew i was supposedly a monk and i still say supposedly right right um, uh i was in medicine uh i helped to set the stage for modern medicine and corrected some wrongs so i was like i was into the body hi yep. fitness yeah uh, so you know, all of this stuff, like, yeah, exactly. To your point. Yeah. It's seems like naughty. Like, yeah. Yeah. Dude. That's so amazing. Yeah, as we wind down this, yeah. Like, I'm glad you mentioned too, you do have an album out. So we're going to do a, a little bonus episode after this, if you're still down for it, if you still got time, if not, we, yeah. can, we can look for another time for it. But, um, yeah, this, uh, and anything else I'll give you what, like the last, uh, you know, time to wrap it up here as far as, uh, where we, we can find you online, any uh, other, you know, uh, quotables that you want to throw in at the end here and you dude, thank you so much for your time today. And yeah, we'll definitely do a, a bonus part two about this album that you've created as well. Appreciate that. Yeah. So where you can find me at coach underscore chase underscore Tolleson on Instagram, uh, chase Tolleson.com. The wait list goes live for problem man pathway cohort two on July 18th. Um, if you missed that, but you heard me on this podcast and you're hearing it like a week prior to us launching on August 1st, tell me you heard me on this podcast and I'll give you the wait list price. Wait list saves um, 40% over full ticket, 30 wow. to 40% over full ticket. So if you get in early, you, you're an action taker, you'll save some coin. Um, and quotable. It is not the lack of opportunity that separates the successful from the unsuccessful. It is the awareness of the opportunity and the swiftness and caliber of action taken. Love it. Chase, thank you so much for coming on. I look forward to our part two. Yes, sir.